Um, thank you both so much for that introduction. I was looking around like, who are they talking about? Um, no, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I will have to just one point of cont contention. Not quite permanent in Minneapolis. Don't chain me there for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> it's too cold. Um, no, but thank you. It's so wonderful to be here, uh, especially on an unseasonably warm day. It was 12 degrees when I left um, Minneapolis yesterday, and so coming here and um, de-thawing was fantastic. Um, and you know, so uh, Abby mentioned the future looks good, which is great because that's one of the stories I'm going to be reading tonight. Um, so this is a collection of 12 short stories, and the short stories range in subject matter and theme, um, and they cover ground from our realistic world to uh, magical worlds to worlds that imagine our potential future. And um, something that was really interesting, I don't know, for those of you who um, may have read uh, the title story, What It Means When a Man Falls from the Sky, which is set in this, you know, this futuristic universe where um, people heal uh, grief through mathematics. Um, you know, when I was writing that, I, I thought that I was making it all up. And I actually recently um, met a scientist who said that, you know, obviously we're not quite at this, the application stage of it, but they are at the stage of sort of creating equations that explain like people's intensity of grief. Like it's, it's a thing that's happening. People are like, you know, um, uh, corresponding grief to like a mathematical equation. And that's just fascinating to me that that's something that exists out in the world and who knows what that's gonna look like 50 years from now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read The Future Looks Good. As Emma fumbles the keys against the lock and doesn't see what came behind her. Her father as a boy when he was still tender, vying for his mother's affection. Her grandmother, overworked to the bone by the women whose houses she dusted, whose laundry she washed, whose children's asses she scrubbed clean. Overworked by the bones of a husband who wanted many sons and the men she entertained to give them to him sees her son to his 13th year with the perfunction of a nurse and dies in her bed with a long, weary sigh. His stepmother regards him as one with a stray dog that comes by often enough that she knows his face, but she'll be damned if she'll let him in. They dance around each other, boy waltzing forward with want, woman pirouetting away. She grew up the eldest daughter of too many, and knows how the needs of a child can drown out a girl's dreams. The boy sees only the turn back, the dismissal, and the father ignores it all, blinded by the delight of an old man with a young wife still fresh between her legs. This one he won't share. And when the boy is 15 and returned from the market to find his possessions in two plastic bags on the front doorstep, he doesn't even knock to find out why or ask where he's supposed to go but squats with other unmothered boys in an abandoned half-built bungalow where his two best shirts are stolen and he learns to carry his money with him at all times. He begs, he sells scrap metal, he steals, and the third comes so easy to him it becomes his way out. He starts small, with picked pockets and goods snatched from poorly tended market stalls. He learns to pick locks, to hotwire cars, to finesse a sleight of hand. When he is 21, the war comes, and while people are cheering in the streets and shouting, Biafra, Biafra, he begins to stockpile goods. When goods become scarce, he makes his fortune. When food becomes scarce, he raids farms in the dead of night, which is how he will meet his wife and white Ezema, fumbling the keys against the lock, doesn't see what came behind her. Her mother at age 22, not beautiful, but with the fresh look of a person who has never been hungry. Her mother is a brash girl who takes more than is offered. It's 1966, months before everything changes, and she's at a party hosted by friends of her parents, and there is a man there, yellow skin like a mango, and square jawed, and body like the statue of David, wealthy. The unmarried, weapon strap, or unmarried women strap on their weaponry, winsome smiles, robust cleavage, accommodating personalities, and go to war over him. 
when she comes out the victor, she takes it as her due. Almost a year into their courting, the war comes. Her people are Biafra loyalists. His people think Ojuku is a fool. On the night of their engagement party, only her people attend. And when she goes by his house the next day, she discovers he has left the country. Her family is soon forced to flee the city, soon forced to barter what they had been able to carry, soon forced to near begging, and for the first time in her life, Food is so scarce she slips into farms at night and harvests tender tubes of half-grown corn in stealth. They boil so soft she eats the inner core and fibrous husk too. One night she finds a small farm tucked behind the hill and there she encounters a man stealing the new yams that would have been hers. There is no competition. He is well fed and strong and even if she tried to raise an alarm out of spite he could silence her but he puts his finger to his lips and gives her a yam. And being who she is, she gestures for two more. He gives her another one and she scurries away. The next night when she returns to the farm, he is waiting for her. She sits by him and they listen to crickets in each other's breathing. When he puts his arm around her, she leans into him and cries for the first time since her engagement party many months ago. And when he puts a yam in her lap, she laughs. And when he takes her hand, she thinks, I am worth three yams. She will have two daughters. The first she names Biafra out of spite, as though to say, look, mother, pin your hopes onto another fragile thing. And the second is named after her mother, who has since died and doesn't know that her daughter has forgiven her for, for choosing the losing side and named her youngest child as a ma, who fumbles the keys against the lock and doesn't see what came behind her. Her sister, whom everyone has taken to calling Bibi, because what nonsense to name a child after a country that doesn't exist. Bibi, who is beautiful in a way her mother never was. Bibi, stubborn like her mother was always. They fought since Bibi was in the womb, lying so heavy on her mother's cervix a light jog could have jostled her out. Bedridden, Bibi's mother grew to resent her and stewed so hot the child should have boiled in her belly. And three years later, as a ma, pretty, yes, but in that manageable way that causes little offense. She is a ghost of Bibi, paler in tone and personality, but sweet in the way Bibi can be when Bibi wants something. Bibi loathes her. No, Ezema can't play with Bibi's toys. No, Ezema can't walk with Bibi and her friends to school. No, Ezema can have a pad. She'll just have to wad up tissues and deal with it. Ezema grows up yearning for her sister's affection. When Bibi is 23, and her parents are struggling to pay the university fees, Bibi meets, meets Godwin, yellow-skinned and square-jawed like his father, and falls in love. She falls harder when her mother warns her away, and when her mother presses, saying, you don't know what his people are like, I do. Bibi responds, you're just angry and bitter that I have a better man than you, and her mother slaps her, and that's the end of that conversation. Ezema serves as a go-between, a role she has been shanghaied into since her youth, and keeps Bibi apprised of all the family news despite her mother's demands that Ezema caught her off. And Godwin is a better provider than Bibi's father, now a modest trader. He rents her a flat. He lends her a car. He blinds her with a constellation of gifts, things she's never had before, like spending money and orgasms. The one time she brings up marriage, he walks out and she can't reach him for 12 days. 12 days that put the contents of her bank account in stark relief. 12 days that she sits in the flat that's in his name, drives the car also in his name, and wonders what is so precious about this name he won't give to her. And when he finally returns to see her packing and grabs her hair, pulling, screaming that even this is his, she is struck by his fist, yes, but also by the realization that maybe her mother was right. The reunion is in tender. Bibi's right eye is almost swollen shut and her mother's mouth is pressed shut, and they neither look at nor speak to each other. 
Her father, who could never bear the tension between the two women, the memories of his turbulent childhood brought back, squeezes Bibi's shoulder, then leaves, and it is that gentle pressure that starts her tears. Soon she is sobbing, and her mother is still stone-faced, but it is a wet face she turns away so no one can see. Ezema takes Bibi to the bathroom, the one they've shared and fought over since they were old enough to speak. She sits her on the toilet lid and begins to clean around her bruises. When she is done, it still looks terrible. When Bibi stands to examine her face, they are both in the mirror. I still look terrible, Bibi says. Yes, you do, Ezema replies. And they are soon laughing, and in their reflection, they notice for the first time that they have the exact same smile. How have they gone this long without seeing that? Neither knows. Bibi worries about her things that are still in the flat. Ezema says not to worry, she will get them. <coughs> Why are you still nice to me? Bibi asks. Habit, Ezema says. Bibi thinks about it for a moment and says something she has never said to her sister. Thank you. And so Ezema fumbles the keys against the lock and doesn't see what came behind her. Godwin, who grew up under his father's corrosive indulgence. Godwin, so unused to hearing no, it hits him like a wave of acid, dissolving the superficial decency of a person who always gets his way. Godwin, who broke his cello when he discovered his younger brother could play it better, which is why he came to be here, watching Ezema, who looks so much like her sister from behind, fumbling the unfamiliar keys against the lock of Bibi's apartment so she doesn't see who comes behind her. Godwin, with a gun, he fires into her back. So that was a happy story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, <laughs> this story is um, filled with lots of happy stories like that. Um, no, this, so this collection is you know, filled with um, s uh, sh sh short stories, and some of them are shorter than others, and some of them are longer. And so um, I like nights like these where I can pick two shorter stories and read them both. Um, so that was the first, and the next one I'm going to read is um, Second Chances. <coughs> Second Chances. Ignore for a moment that two years out of grad school, I'm old enough to buy my own bed and shouldn't ask my father to chip in on the mattress so that he shows up with my mother, who looks like she stepped out of a photograph and she tries to charm the salesman, something she was never good at but it somehow works this time and he takes off 20%. Ignore for a moment that she's wearing an outfit I haven't seen in 18 years, not since Nigeria, when she was pregnant with my younger sister, though not yet showing, and fell down the concrete steps to our house, ripping that dress from hem to thigh. Ignore that she flits from bed to bed, bouncing on each one like she hasn't sat on a mattress in a while, and the salesman follows her around like he'd like to crawl in with her. Ignore all this because my mother has been dead for eight years. <coughs> my father avoids the look I give him, and I'm glad there are beds around because I collapse onto one, unable to stand. When I grab my father's wrist, I cannot, at this juncture, imagine touching her. He twists away from me. I follow him, but he refuses to be cornered, so I walk up to my mother and ask, what the hell are you doing here? The salesman looks at me like I kicked her, and my mother looks pained like I might as well have, but shock leaves very little room for guilt. Your daddy and I are buying you a bed. Didn't you say you wanted a bed? The gentle chiding is something I never thought I'd hear again, and my knees almost buckle, but something about the casual way she's correcting me, like she's got any right, angers me. Why are you here? You're supposed to be, my father interrupts this, do you want the bed or not? Both of them stare at me expectantly. I want to press the issue, but I also really, really need the bed. 
I nod and the salesman hesitates like he doesn't want to give the discount if it's for me, then walks away to ring it up. My mother is digging through her purse and I know it's not to pay because she never does when my dad is around, but maybe she's different now. Then she sighs and says, Ike, darling, have you seen my sunglasses? The photo my mother has stepped out of was taken in 1982. She is wearing a green and cara print kaftan belted at the waist and it billows becomingly. There is a red patina in the photo that has developed over time. As she stands in the kitchen now, humming as she checks the cupboards, I see that the red tint is on her, starker against the white of the cabinet than at the store. The edges of her face are soft, as though she's kept the slight blur of the photo as well. Slung over her shoulder is a tan raffia purse, all that's missing are her red sunglasses. In the picture, they are tucked into the V at her neck, awaiting the Inugu sun. My father putters around her, and he is grayer, paunchier, slower than the last time I saw them together, but they move the same way, a tender, familiar dance. Every time I take a breath to say something, my father glances at me and his delight shuts me up. When they, when they bend their heads together and begin to whisper, I slip away from the counter and into my father's room. I have to find the photo. It's missing from the dressing table that even after all this time, still holds my mother's jewelry and perfumes, glittering bottles that range from Avon to Armani. The jewelry is just as varied, but most of it is costume, loud, bobbly pieces crusted with bling. My mother wore no jewelry in the photo, not even a ring, as she and my father weren't wed at the time, but brave young lovers with, as my mother used to say, nothing to prove. There are other pictures of her on the dressing table. One when she was a child, stiff between her parents, long dead. Pictures of her at my high school graduation, on my dad's 50th birthday, and my favorite, the one where she's fluffing my baby sister's frilly white pantaloons and dad snaps just when Udama kisses the top of mom's head. Udama. I hear the front door open and she calls out in that Lucy M. home way of hers and I rush to warn her before it's too late. When Udama walks in, she pauses for a stunned moment and my father holds his arms out like, ta-da, and she does what I should have done when I first saw my mother. She runs to her and holds her so tight about the waist, it's a wonder mom can breathe, her sobs shaking them both. There's no way I'm going back to my apartment. I call into work and leave a message punctuated by unconvincing coughs. It's my 13th strike, but I don't care. Udama is practically in mom's lap, telling her every stupid thing she's ever wanted to tell her, and then some. Like my dad, she has simply accepted my mother's presence like it's nothing. I sit off to the side while the three of them are pressed close. Udama stops and stares at mom's face and I wait for her to say something about it, but she just moves to the floor and snuggles her head into mom's stomach. She was 10 when our mother died, just off the plane from Lagos for summer vacation. She's filling mom in on that trip and then on every trip after that, eight years of miles. My father occasionally interrupts to update my mother on who is where now, and it is the first time he acknowledges sh she's been gone. And what about you, Uche? What have you been doing? They wait to see if I'll play along. I've been getting over you, you know, because you're dead. My mother puts her hand to her chest where the sunglasses should be, like I've just cursed and my father shakes his head. As the silence grows, I leave. I was a child prone to hysterics. Every cut was a deep wound that would surely keloid and scar me for life. Every playground slight an unforgivable infraction that merited a meltdown. I also took to stealing, a habit that saw me disinvited from many of my schoolmates' homes so that I spent most of my free time playing in the salon slash furniture shop my mother ran. I often wonder if I turned out the way I did from all those hours of inhaling turpentine and hairspray. When things were slow, my mother and her assistants, Abegali, would curl my hair into elaborate dews. 
There exists a picture of me grinning as though showing off all my teeth would save the world, hair curled and fanned around my head like gele. A begali had persuaded my mother to powder my face, aided by my company and tantrum that had worn down her reluctance. I resemble a Texas debutante turned trophy wife, flanked by my exhausted looking mother because above all else, I was exhausting. My father, po po my father was posted in Algiers by the oil company he worked for, and many times, until Udama, it was just my mother and me. My childhood hysterics eventually congealed into an off-putting self-centeredness that was the topic of my mother's and my last conversation eight years ago. After my mother died, I spent a few months in a place where they spooned food and medication into me. My father and I have never spoken of the state he found me in, <coughs> Alabama, to which I had run away, home to the ex I promised never to see again. Nor have we spoken of the state he found me in, catatonic over after a handful of pills, curled in the moon of vomit. But when I came to, I was in a hospital, and my father was there, and I just knew things had to get better. I was 22. It had taken me a year and a half to get my shit together, and then five years to complete a master's in technical communications I should have taken too. I'd lived at home until a year ago, but after years of feeling like an exposed nerve, I finally myelinated. I still had trouble holding a job and worked at the parts table at a pipe supply a few days a week. Sometimes even those few days would be too much and I'd disappear but those absences became less frequent as things got better and I began to be a person again. And now she just shows up, la-di-da ho-hum, like it's not a big fucking deal. I resume my search for the photograph. I avoid my old room, still the cyclone of a mess I left it in. If it's in there, it will never be found. I head to Adama's instead, where it's neat as a catalog. I start with the closest chest of drawers, as uncluttered as the room, every sock and panty folded into a tidy square. It's easy to see that the picture isn't there. I reach my hand into the drawer and scatter her things anyway. I'm moving on to the next drawer when Udama sighs in the doorway. I ignore her and continue digging. I can feel it coming upon me, the unfurling of myself until all that will remain is a raw center. I have to find the picture. I have to. Udama stills me with a hand on my shoulder. She hugs me from behind, and I am once again taken by her intuition. It was like that growing up too, starting after we moved to Houston when she was only five and I was 17. She's always been able to sense my mood, what it needs, and contort herself to fit that need. Now she whispers, why can't you let me have this? Please let me have this, but I can't. She's supposed to be dead. Udama flinches at the word. Don't you have questions? I don't care. You shouldn't either. You were so unhappy when she left. How can you be upset that she's back? I face her. She is dressed in the uniform required by the Christian high school <coughs> she attends. I've never asked her if she really believes wary of introducing yet another complication to my story, adding unbeliever and sinner to psycho, but she's always seemed so sure about everything, so accommodating of fate in a way that eludes me. I envy her that sureness. I envy her the uncomplicated relationship with my mother, where mom was just mom and not yet a woman with whom she disagreed. I retreat to avoid answering and run into my mother in the doorway. Have you girls seen my sunglasses? My answer to Udama's question has sucked the moisture from my throat, and I move past her, unable to speak. Udama murmurs something, my mother murmurs a reply, and they no doubt begin a touching conversation I will never be a part of. Downstairs, my father has fallen asleep on the couch, a glass of wine and his cell phone on the table in front of him. I wonder what my mother said when he poured it, as he'd been a teetotaler since before I was born. He looks larger than I've ever seen him, as though inflated with glee, and he snores loudly, the soundtrack of my youth. I notice it then. 
a grimy white corner picking out of his phone case from a slot meant to house credit cards. I lift the case and run to the small guest bathroom, locking myself inside. I grip the white corner and slide it out. The photo has been folded, then folded again, so that it accordions open to reveal a red-tinged couch and the edge of a large speaker that serves as an end table. My mother, who should be standing in front of the couch, is missing. In the corner, so small I almost miss them, are the sunglasses she searches for, almost off frame. A sob gurgles in my throat. I sit to steady myself and my right leg bounces a nervous jig. I remember our last conversation. I was in the living room, waiting till it was time to pick up Adama from the airport. She'd spent two summer months with my aunt, whom I disliked for her utter disinclination to put up with my bullshit. It was close to time for me to leave, and I just kept <coughs> flipping through TV channels till I fell asleep. I awoke to my mother yelling, you mean you are still here? I get a call from the airport police because I think your sister is abandoned and you are here? I thought something happened to you. Her urgency chased away the grogginess and I was suddenly alert and apologetic. A quick glance showed that I was almost four hours late and panic flowered in my stomach. I knew my mother was beyond common fury because she tossed her Bible on the couch like it was a dime store novel. She shoved her phone in my face, the one she turned silent every Wednesday night so that she didn't get distracted at Bible study, and there were almost 30 messages. I had violated her cardinal immigrant rule, live quietly and above the law. Every time, Uche, every time I ask you to do a simple thing, you cannot do it. I'm sorry. You're sorry, you're sorry, always sorry. No. She cuts my response off at the knees. What you are is disappointing. You are so disappointing. You are disappointing. The last iteration was said, not with calcifying anger, but an abrupt sadness that underscores the truth of it. In that tone resonated every, my every fuck up, every tantrum I'd pulled, every item I'd stolen, every time she must have cringed at having to introduce me as her daughter. I ran out to the patio and slammed the door so hard it cracked, the sound of splintering glass taking the edge off my hurt. My mother started up again, shouting as she grabbed her keys and went to pick Adama. I never told my father about our last exchange words, nor Udama, not even the therapist at that place who dug and dug because he knew I kept something from him. <laughs> the secret of it settled a cloak of guilt on me I will wear for the rest of my life. Now, when no frantic knocks sound, I begin to feel the sheepishness of a child who has hidden whom no one cares to find. I emerge to see my father where I left him, oblivious to the missing photograph. Someone has put a blanket on him. The clang of kissing pots comes from the kitchen, and I know who is there. She glances up at me when I enter, but returns to the task at hand, a bouquet of ingredients to turn into soup. Why wouldn't you let yourself enjoy this, my mother says. And it echoes Udama's why can't you let me have this so closely, I suspect the conspiracy. When I say nothing, she turns to me, naked hand in hand, and asks a question whose answer has thorned my side. Noam. What do you want from me? The answer I imagine. I want you to boil the chicken with onions and salt. I want you to melt the palm oil in medium heat and sizzle agbana till it dissolves. I want you to cough when the pepper tickles your throat. I want you to sprinkle in crayfish so tiny, I believed at age four, they've been harvested half formed from their mother's womb. I want you to watch the agbana thicken the water and add the stockfish and the okra and the spinach and the boiled meat and the salt you never put enough of and call us when it's ready and say grace and be gracious and forgive me. The answer I give, the lopsided shrug I manage when I can't find words. She turns back to chopping and I leave when the onion gets to her eyes. When I enter my room, I try to conjure happier memories 
but all that comes to mind is five minutes ago and the last time we spoke. I crawl into my old bed, still half covered in items I promised to sort, and hug a skein of yarn to my chest, hoping for the temporary erasure of sleep. She is gone in the morning. The kitchen holds her remains, a turned over pot in the dish rack and the scent of okra. I find my father on the couch, showered and dressed. His eyes are red and swollen, but he is smiling. Udama sleeps in the city close by. They must have spent the night talking. My father checks the slot on his phone case and sighs like he never expected the picture to still be there. The picture. It should be in the pot pocket I frantically pat, then turn inside out. I run to my room and check the bed, tossing aside wool and books and purses long out of style. When I can't find it, I tear the sheets off, sending everything to the floor. Then I see the photograph, almost unrecognizable for the crumpled state it's in. I try to smooth it out, but it's almost torn in two, my mother's face split open in a paper imitation of the accident's aftermath. I unravel to those many years ago, to Alabama, and only now can I utter the words that have haunted me. I'm sorry. I love you. Please forgive me. Thank you.